In this video, we are going to talk about some historical trends in the, in the capital markets. Let's review some key terms, risk, return, trade-off, uh, two key lessons from capital market history. You can go back as far back as you want, but the idea is that if you're going to take risk, if you're going to take risk, there should be a reward. If not, there will be no reason to take the risk. Also, the greater the risk you take, the greater the potential reward should be. Now, notice the word potential. It's not guaranteed. It will be uncertain. But there should be a potential of a greater reward if there's a greater risk. If not, you shouldn't take the greater risk. Also, the flip side is that there's a greater potential for loss. The greater the potential reward will come with a greater risk, meaning a greater potential for loss as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, dollar versus percent returns. Uh, well, it's not a versus, but there's two different things to look at. You can look at the total return of the dollar which is pretty much the return on investment measured in dollars. If you have you buy a stock for $2 and you sell it for $5, then you had $3 in return. But that's not a percentage, that's a dollar amount. So here's an example of two ways you get returns in the form of dollars uh, with a stock, for example. So the total dollar returns is going to be dividends plus capital gains. Dividends is self-explanatory. A stock may or may not pay dividends, but if they do, that's money you receive in dollars. And then if we go back to the example I said, you buy a stock for $2 instead of for five, you have those other $3 you got from the appreciation of the stock price, meaning capital gains. So if you take those $3 plus whatever dividends received, that would be your total dollar return. Here, they're just defining capital gains that I already did. Price received would have been the $5 in my example. Price paid would have been the $2 in my example. Now, if you look at it from a percent instead of dollars, then is the, the return on investment measured as a percentage of the original investment. So let's say you buy a stock for $10 and we'll start easy, zero dividends, and then you sell it for $11. So that extra dollar that you got when you sold it, that's your dollar return. But if you take that dollar and divide it by the original $10 that you originally paid for the stock, then you have a 10% return. The formula will look like the $11 that you sold it minus the $10 which you bought it for, divided by the $10. You may have seen that formula before as new minus old divided by old. And they have all other different ways to do it. Now, if you have a dividend, you will do the same thing I did, but you will add the dividend before you divide by the $10. So let's say there was a $1 dividend. So you buy it for $10. You receive a dollar dividend while you hold it, and then you sell it for $11. For, so all the money that came in was $11 plus the dollar, that's $12. Minus the $10 you paid for, that's $2. Divided by the original $10, now you have a 20% return. And that's uh, kind of like what they're doing here, but separately first, the dividend yield, and the example I provided would have been with this formula, but that would have been $1 divided by the $10 you got, so that's 10%, that $10 you paid for. So that's 10% on the dividend alone. The capital gain would have been the $11 minus the $10 divided by the $10. So that would have been also 10%. So if you want the total return as a percentage, you can add the 10% from the dividends, add the 10% from the capital gains, and you would have gotten the 20%. If you want to put it all together, it looks like this. The dividend, the $1 dividend plus the $11 that you sold the stock, 
minus the $10, divide it all by the $10. You will also get the 20%. $1 plus 11, 12, minus 10, 2, 2 divided by 10, 20%. Risk premiums. First, let's talk about what the risk-free rate is so that we can better understand risk premiums. In the United States, we have this thing called treasury bills, and those are federal bonds that are considered risk-free because the U.S. government, the federal U.S. government, guarantees that they will pay the interest of the bond. So there is no default risk. So if there's no default risk, therefore it's risk-free. Now, side note, nothing in the world is fully risk-free but this is about as low of a risk you're gonna get. So as long as the United States continues to exist as a country and the laws do not change, we can call that risk-free. It's a fair assumption to say that it's riskless. So the idea that you can get some kind of return without any risk means that that should be the starting point for everybody else that has risk. If there's anything out there with at least a little bit of risk and is going to give you the same return as a treasury bill or less, then no, nobody should buy that investment. So this will be considered the starting point of it all. Now, the risk premium, it's the excess return on a risky asset over the risk-free rate. For example, a quick one, let's say the treasury bill is given 2% and that would be risk-free. Then you have a stock out there that is returning 10%. So the premium is not going to be 10% because you could have gotten 2% without risk. So you have to take the 10% minus the 2% of the risk-free. So the premium is that 8%. So what that stock is really paying you for the risk that it has is 8%, not 10% from this perspective. So that's a reward for bearing additional risk over the risk-free. Here are a few examples of what it will look like with some historical uh, risk premiums. Uh, historically speaking, large stocks, will average about 12.2%, but when you take away the risk-free premium, in this case is 3.3 in this example, the average over historical uh, returns, you're really looking at 8.9%. Same here, small stocks, you're looking at that. I'm gonna make a side note here. When you see large stock and small stocks, small stocks typically on average have a higher return. But as we mentioned, on this slide earlier, the higher the, the return, the greater the risk. So we have to keep in mind that these have a higher risk of loss as well. They typically tend to be positive. And what it means is that you may have to hold uh, on, on them in order to get those average returns the ups and downs can be really, really, really wild compared to these. Okay, so long-term corporate bonds, those are the private sector. This is what it looks like. Long-term government bonds, but these are not, these are not the federal ones. The federal, these are the state and below, municipal, county, etc. And then the US Treasury Bill, in this case, the federal government, it just is a wash. So uh, there's no risk premium. You're just getting the minimum you should get for a risk-free asset. Now, the asterisk is saying, well, that's by definition. Always keep that in mind. As I mentioned earlier, there's nothing in the world that is 100% risk-free. We just define it as risk-free, and we just calculate everything else around that definition. Now, as we said... Potential reward, greater potential reward, greater the risk. So now we know how we calculate the returns, right? That's the number we use for returns, some percentages, the gains and the dividends, the returns. 
But when we talk about that risk, this is how we, we calculate or measure that risk. We use variance. Yes, this is the same variance you learned in your statistics class or before you took this one. And you also know that when you take the square root of variance, you get the standard deviation. Now, typically, if you hear variability, they're talking about the variance. If you hear volatility, they're talking about standard deviation. Uh, but do not be surprised if you hear people say variability and they're talking about standard deviation and volatility for variance. It's somewhat of an exchangeable term. By definition, this slide is correct. Uh, but um, industry jargon, sometimes use exchangeably because people understand that it's just how much can it go up and down. And return variability, review the concepts. So do a little bit of review here. Normal distribution. Yes, that's the same normal distribution you heard before in your stats class. And it's that bell curve, bell-shaped curve. And it describes the mean and the variance. This is what we're talking about. So the way you apply this on returns and risk, we're not going to get in too deep in detail. However, if you look at it from this perspective, the average is in the middle. So this is a stock that averages 12.1%, but it has a standard deviation of roughly speaking around 20%, it's probably a little less, but roughly speaking that. And that standard deviation, if you go up to three standard deviations, is telling you that you have the potential of earning up to 71.5% returns, which is very large. So it has that potential. It doesn't mean you will, but there's a probability or possibility that you get it. It's low, but it's there. And all of these also are potential earning uh, returns. But as we mentioned, if you have potential returns going this way, you also have potential losses. So you could find yourself under the same probability same chance of being down here at negative 47.3%. If you have a higher standard deviation, then this number will be higher. Instead of 71, it could be 90. So even greater potential for returns. But if, you if this number goes up, this number is going to go down on the left. So then you're going to have a greater potential for loss. And that's how it works in relation to risk and returns. Here are some historical values, but they are presenting average return uh, geometric and average return arithmetic. We will cover that on part two of this video.